We have been listening about the great potential of the Caspian region since yesterday. We have very interesting sessions. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Muhammad Sayyid. I work for a UN agency called International Trade Center. This agency is the 50% of the budget comes from the UN, which is the development part, and 50% from the WTO, which is the trade part. So it is at the nexus of the trade and the development. And my responsibilities is to assist, especially the developing countries and the economies in transition, uh, to reduce the cost and time of doing their business and to increasing their competitiveness to be in the player. And specifically, we work with the private sector also so that the small and medium-sized enterprises can be made part of the value chains. <clears throat> In today's sessions, let me introduce my panelist. I'm still missing one of my panelists, but as he comes, uh, you have listened to him since yesterday, he will join. Uh, let me introduce uh, my first panelist is Derek Elhorn. He is, um, specializes in the crowd uh, collaboration, the internet, uh, the technologies, and he's founder and the chairman of the Hyperloop uh, Transportation Technologies. Uh, I'll skip paper and then I have Azar with us, who is the deputy CEO of the Azar Telecom. So we'll have the perspective from the telecom industries also. Uh, we have with us uh, Alex from the tech startup. Uh, he's director of the embedded uh, micro micro, and he will be talking to us their experience in Switzerland and how it can be replicated to the um, Caspian region. Uh, then we have uh, Marina with us. Uh, Marina is the postdoctoral uh, uh, fellow at the Center for Eastern European Studies at the University of Zurich. Uh, she would be talking how the regulatory compliance, and especially in the light of the sanctions, how what are the challenges which brings, and how we should be uh, addressing those. And then uh, we have uh, Tale with us. Uh, he is the director general of the Baku International uh, Sea Trade Port. Before I pass on the mics to my <coughs> panelist, uh, let me bring you and connect you with the panelist that what is going, we are going to talk. As uh, you would be <coughs> seeing on the screen, uh, we are going to talk about new transit opportunities uh, as a means to access to the enhancing trade and transit connectivity in this uh, region. Uh, when we talk about uh, the market access, uh, starting from the firm's productivity, then its connectivity, whether it is the freight forwardings, whether it is the ports, whether it is rail, road, by air, then the border regulatory agencies, and then the others. So it is a throughout uh, from, uh, how do you say, producer to the consumer, and we have to see in that context. When we talk about the connectivity of a region, as the Great Caspian uh, region is, then we are seeing that how those countries which have been struggling of being landlocked can be land-linked, that transition. And that, in my view, have two aspects to it. One is about the hard infrastructure, which is about the roads, which is about the ports. And then it has to be combined with a soft infrastructure and from the soft infrastructure, it is the com regulatory compliance as well as the regulatory cooperation in the region. And living in the 21st century, I think the technology has come in such a big way that it is changing everything we do from our personal life to our professional lives, uh, from trade to transit to connectivity. So uh, we would see that how this infrastructure, which is supported by the advancement of the technology, uh, <coughs> can help this region to connect. Uh, let me invite my first speaker, Derek, uh, who has done the work uh, more, uh, the technology and the transportation technology, that how this would work uh, in the region. Dirk, please. All right, good morning, everybody. So as you just heard, my name is Dirk Alborn. I'm the founder and chairman of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. And um, well, we say that we transform transportation at the speed of sound. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, 
So what is Hyperloop? Imagine a capsule filled with people hovering inside a tube and moving really, really fast, basically just below the speed of sound from one place to the other. Inside this tube, we're creating a low pressure environment. So basically that means that we have vacuum pumps along the tracks that take the air out. So that's a capsule, which is basically similar to an airplane without wings, can travel without a lot of resistance. This means that we can go really fast with very little energy. The whole system is completely green. We're using the same right of way to have solar panels on top. We use wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and depending on the climate, even geothermal. And um, many times, obviously depends on the routes, we're even able to produce more energy than we're consuming. And um, that's a very important part, because when we set out to build this system, or to analyze the system, we found out that on one hand, from a technology point of view, the technology basically all existed. It has been now six years that we have been working on it. But what we also saw is that um, basically there's no rail system, no metro system in the whole world that's profitable. They're all relying on government subsidies, which is a problem why in many regions you don't really have infrastructure, right? Because it's not only about building them, it's about maintaining them as well. So, but when you start out to build a completely new mode of transportation, you have a very unique opportunity. You have the opportunity to build a transportation system the way it should be done in 2020, because when we start out, and uh, if you look, I don't know, you're traveling the train, the bus, even the airplane, it's not really a great experience. It sucks, right? It's terrible. Nobody really enjoys traveling. So, but we have a lot of technologies that actually can make that easier. So this allows us to really rethink and start with a white piece of paper and say, how is this supposed to look? What is the business model behind transportation? Is it still selling a ticket or is it monetizing the time the passenger spends inside a vehicle, for example? And um, all of these. Um, in terms of where we are, because often when we talk about Hyperloop, people think that it's uh, something that's out decades, but in reality, we are only out years. Um, we are now in the process at this moment to finalize the first or uh, complete integration of the Hyperloop system in Toulouse. Um, and um, so we have the world's first passenger capsule already ready. It's being integrated into the system. We signed several agreements around the world. Um, we're planning later this year to start construction on the first commercial line uh, in the Emirates, in Abu Dhabi, in Al Ghadir. And um, we have been working very strongly on probably the most difficult part, which is uh, regulation. So we've been working together with TÜV Süd in creating the safety guidelines. We have been working together with Munich Re, which is one of the largest or probably the largest reinsurance company in the world. Um, they, are, they said that they're able to insure our system. So that's a very important part when you move into commercialization. So. Um, we plan roughly to take two and a half years to finish the system in Abu Dhabi once we start construction. So that's when you and me can start riding the Hyperloop. So, and then of course, next step, Caspian region, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dirk. Uh, let me bring in Alex and uh, listen from uh, Alex that uh, could you share with us your experience that how this technology has helped in Switzerland and how this can be benefited uh, by the uh, Caspian region and the different government as well as the private sector, please. Yes, of course, thank you. So Miromico is a Swiss high-tech uh, engineering company. We are developing um, IoT sensor devices, IoT technology, which is um, a wireless technology um, in, intended to um, link a lot of sensor in um, remote areas or urban areas with very low infrastructure cost and um, to cr connect, for example, pipelines um, to co connect um, to pre pre provide um, maintenance, uh, pre uh, predictive maintenance on pipelines to detect um, breaches or breaks of pipelines in a, in a remote area without someone walking by every day or every week. 
Um, we have the great situation here in Switzerland that we have a lot of technology, we have high-tech companies here. We can test, we can develop all the kind of system and then we can scale it up into, into the different areas of the world. Um, and one system we are currently working on is um, providing um, LoRaWAN technology or IoT wireless technology um, solely based on satellite communication, which means there is no uh, ground infrastructure needed beside the sensors. So in whatever remote area, we can connect sensors and devices to to the to direct the satellite and just collect the data from all around the world. Um, all these devices we are we are now have, have now have now built in here in Switzerland. We can deploy them all around the world and increase all around security and um, provide more services and um, data for um, all kinds of systems in uh, areas where there is no people around. Or And once the infrastructure is already set up, we can also bring more sensors into, for example, for agriculture or um, street lightning or, or all kinds of um, smart city applications, um, which is now going to grow up all around the world. Thank you, Alex. And let me now bring into the discussion from technology uh, to specific form of the technology uh, which is being practiced on from the telecom. Uh, let me uh, request uh, Azar at this point of time that how do you think uh, the telecom industry can play a significant role in connecting the region and the region to uh, beyond its uh, strict geographical boundaries. Azar, please. Hi, everyone. It brings me pleasure to be here in Davos uh, at this Caspian week. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate uh, the organizers. They really organized a very nice platform where we can discuss uh, our regional projects with uh, our regional stakeholders and also international partners. Uh, I represent Azer Telecom, which is a private company and the uh, big, largest telecommunication operator in Azerbaijan and in South Caucasus. Uh, Azer Telecom was founded in 2008 as a backbone provider, which is connecting Azerbaijan to the global internet. Uh, we have a diversified and a sustainable network, uh, which is connecting all our uh, major cities and regions in Azerbaijan. And our international network also integrated into uh, all major uh, telecommunications hub around the world. Uh, when we talk about the telecommunications and the data traffic today, uh, we first of all we talk about the infrastructure, and the global infrastructure, data, global data infrastructure enables new businesses, but infrastructure needs new data cables which will connect different continents uh, with uh, regional hubs in those continents. Uh, and the statistics, uh, if we look at, according to, for example, to telegeography, which is one of the leading analysts in the telecommunication business, uh, the growth in uh, data traffic is so fast, so rapid, that if even it's even difficult to predict uh, what will be the data traffic in coming three five, five years. It, it's so even the difficult to predict three, in three five years span uh, the, the the real data traffic. But there is some calculation that uh, the data traffic between Europe and Asia uh, by the end of 2024 will be uh, the growth will be around 900 percent. It's very big amount of traffic uh, and one of the uh, key initiatives and the uh, uh, projects we now as a telecom implementing is the Trans-Caspian uh, fiber optic project and this project is uh, implemented uh, in the framework of the regional digital hub program. So the idea is just uh, connect Europe and Asia uh, with the fastest at the, with the lowest latency road, which is uh, passing through Azerbaijan and uh, connecting all uh, countries uh, of the Caspian, greater Caspian region. And what we've done so far, uh, we have 
established a very good cooperation with the companies around the Caspian Sea. In last year, in March 19, uh, we uh, there was a uh, signed a, the, there was signed a bilateral gov intergovernmental agreement between Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan on the construction of this uh, submarine cable, uh, which is about 400 kilometers and which is uh, connecting Azerbaijan uh, city Siazan with Aktau in Kazakhstan, and. Uh, in November 2019, in November 28, we have signed uh, the next contract with, inter, that's also intergovernmental agreement, and the, the, with Turkmenistan government. And there will be second line, a seabed line, uh, which will connect uh, uh, Siazan and uh, Turkmenbashi in Turkmenistan. It's about 300 kilometers. And we believe that uh, this is the, uh, uh, yesterday, my colleague uh, talked about the ancient Silk Road. So we are, uh, again, there is already ongoing projects, uh, transport projects, which rebuilds actually uh, Silk Road. And we will provide those, tra tra not just the transport corridors, but also uh, the population of the Eurasia, which is about uh, four, 4 billion people with fastest uh, data traffic. And uh, we, it, it, it will be the, the Transcaspian fiber optic project will be really a game changer in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Azar. Um, now I would request uh, Talit to come in. Uh, the specific uh, aspect on which I would like Talit to talk about is that this middle corridor is presenting as an alternate to the traditional route of maritime um, uh, the transport. How do you see um, coming from uh, uh, the port authorities and regulating the port that how much this is complementing uh, towards the connectivity and how much this offers you some kind of a competition to be more efficient and to be more focused on the service delivery? Thank you. Yesterday we had a discussion about reviving of the Silk Road. So today's discussion is a little bit about what is going to change in the next 10 to 20 years and how these new technologies are, are going to affect us. As I mentioned yesterday, 90, 95% of the trade between Europe and Asia is done maritime. So it bypasses our region altogether. It's done by big ocean liners and it has, we don't see it. Yes, the traffic by rail has increased tremendously, as was yesterday, almost 4,000 block trains have been passed between Europe and Asia last year. But technologies like Hyperloop and what implications it's going to bring overall for global trade and also for our region, I don't think people really understand it. There will be large, as I said yesterday, there will be emergence of large cities, new hubs across Eurasia. Whether we like it or not, China's One Belt, One Road initiative is going to complement, make sure that this happens. It is about these host countries, whether they utilize this strategy for their own purposes or not. What Azerbaijan does, certainly we take the advantage of it, make sure that port and free zone around it, the new city and the new airport is going to emerge as a result of this trade. But in, in the next step, obviously, we are going to discuss, okay, in the future, if Hyperloop technology, for example, comes into play, and I know, uh, I follow the Hyperloop technology for a long time. They are also reducing now the cost of building it by investing in new technologies, especially this tube technology, which is the cost part of it. And with finding a feasible model for new hub uh, building of the Hyperloop, just imagine your containers traveling 1,200 kilometers per hour. That means instead of sending that container by a traditional ocean liner, you are going to just put this into this tube and it will end up in Europe, maybe in three days. So it will disrupt the entire traditional global trade that used to depend only on ships. So this is what we need to think about when we look into next 20 years. 
So, and, and make sure that all these new technologies complement each other. What Azer Telecom does, for example, obviously new cities are going to emerge, new populations are going to emerge, they would need data. All this infrastructure needs data in parallel to each other. So synchronizing these developments in Central Eurasia will enable us once again to revive this ancient concept of the, of the hubs in the 21st century. Thank, thank you, Ari. Uh, let me acknowledge and welcome Babar Badar. Uh, one of my panelists uh, was got stuck. Babar is the immediate past president of FIATA, which is the largest NGO in the freight forwarding and the logistic industries. And Babar himself has an experience of almost 40 years. Doesn't look from his age, but still, uh, he started very young. <laughs> uh, Babar, uh, let me bring you, we were talking about the connectivity and the role of the technology in the connectivity and how this traditional maritime might be challenged by the hard infrastructure which is being developed under the middle corridor. How do you see from the logistic and transportation perspective uh, the, this region connecting with uh, the two biggest economies which are the neighbors, the Russia, the China, as well as the Europe, uh, how do you see the role of the logistics industry uh, being, uh, being a driver of the connectivity? Thank you very much. Um, um, apologies again. Um, I was caught up in the traffic by, in, in my pickup, and I uh, um, especially didn't want to be late for a, such an illustrious compare of this, uh, of this program. So um, at the cost of being repetitive, because I'm sure this may have been touched in the last few minutes, uh, but uh, the subject revolves around this um, this uh, uh, this particular area. Uh, you see, um, the, the, we are seeing huge dynamic change in the modes of transport and the way things are going to be carried, uh, particularly east-west trade in the region and, and beyond the region is going to have a substantial trade. And a lot of this is being driven by um, the Belt and Road Initiative and other initiatives which are springing up subsequently from that. And as I briefly heard my colleague over here from Azerbaijan saying that, uh, that there will be an effect, and I want to reiterate that particular point, that uh, I think um, the role, uh, you, you know, traditionally, uh, the shipping lines used to be the primary contractors of cargo. So they would be the face of transport to the merchant. But over the years, the role of the shipping lines have reduced and the role of the, uh, of, of the logistics operator has increased because transportation with the common use of the container has moved from port to port, which was traditional, to now point to point. So it's point warehouse to warehouse or point to point, point of production to the point of consumption. And because of that aspect, the role of international freight forwarders, logistics companies has grown a lot. So even commercially, you will see a lot of uh, shipping lines are merging, shrinking, um, uh, going belly up. A lot of things are happening. On the other side, with the, with, the, with the logistic companies, you see that their size is growing. There are now companies with 1,000 and 1,400 and 1,200 offices, 800 offices, and there are lots of them. And their strength is going because they have become the primary contractors of freight to the merchant, and then they sublet it to the shipping lines as one of the contractors. So because of multimodal transport, now uh, shipping lines are recipient of a certain part of that. So the bulk or the cream of the freight doesn't go to the shipping lines because they're not the primary contractors, and it is the logistic company. So logistic companies are able to generate this revenue. Now this revenue in turn is being reinvested by these organizations into transport infrastructure into um, more opportunities on the land. So you see, you will see a, a large growth in this area in connectivity. And as I said, with the change with Belt and Road, you'll see the role of the railways rising. Now, railways in most ex economies don't even take, uh, in most economies don't even carry 10% of the cargo. Uh, most of them are even 5% or maybe less, and some maybe around 10%, 12%. But you will, we will see a growth in this area. So trucking, uh, transport, uh, rails transport, these are the areas um, uh, and, 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 and logistic centers, um, all these will become very important. And at the Caspian Sea, in the Caspian region, um, we see that there will be, of course, the eastern connect, 
towards China and Kazakhstan and this area. And there'll be a, a Western connect going in through the Caucasus and north into, into Europe. And then you will also see a Southern connect, which goes down um, into um, uh, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and into Pakistan and Iran. Well, Iran today is under sanctions, but you know, uh, so these are the areas, growth areas that we see, and we'll see more investment coming over here. Thank you, Babar, and confirming this approach that nowadays, and especially for the Caspian region, the connectivity means starting from the producer till the consumers uh, across the supply chain. And very timely, you have flagged this issue of the sanctions uh, because my next uh, panelist, um, as a postdoctoral fellow in the East European uh, has specialization in the sanctions. So I, I want to bring in this, uh, uh, Maria, that uh, uh, when we talk about this connectivity, of course, the role of the private sector, the role of the governments, and government has its different kind of, not only purely trade or the economy perspective, they also have the political economy consideration, and these tariffs, these sanctions sometimes impact the way the transaction or the connectivity is being handled and the trade is being uh, conducted. So, uh, could you please uh, share your views? How do you see that in this era we are, the, we are vying for the connectivities, we are using the technology to be more efficiently connected, and still from the political economy perspective, we see these kind of, do you see also like me as a roadblocks, or do you see some incentive to be more rigorous in that, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, clearly sanctions became a buzzword recently, and it doesn't only concern access to global markets, but also when we talk about the infrastructure connectivity that was mentioned, uh, pipelines, uh, maritime industry as the recent uh, industry that was uh, uh, indirectly targeted by sanctions. We haven't seen a lot of talk of new technology that's been sanctions, but I guess that all depends on how strategically important it will be in the future. So let's say if Hyperloop will be the key transport that might be something by sanctions. But I'd like to raise a couple of points on the development of sanctions. So over the last uh, few years, we've seen the enormous proliferation of sanctions regime um, uh, in particular from the US and with the enormous power of US secondary sanctions, which is based on the centrality of US uh, financial system and the dominance of US dollar. So in according to Gibson Dunn, the um, law firm in 2017, uh, the Trump administration imposed uh, more than 1000 uh, targets on its sanctions list in that year alone which means that um, with this rise of sanctions, we see an enormous uh, increase of compliance costs for the private sector, but also unintended consequences for third parties who are not much involved. And here, it's not just about numbers, but it runs much deeper. Um, and there are two problems with that. First of all is that Quite often, um, regulations are quite vague, so um, the guidance comes uh, quite late or the private sectors, the companies need to um, uh, inquire about what is specifically meant in this regulation. And the last case, ExxonMobil against OFAC sort of clarifies that wasn't enough uh, time to warn the company to withdraw, to divest from its dealings with Rosneft. Um, and it's sort of unsurprisingly that OFAC list misinterpretation of regulation is one of the common errors in uh, complying with sanctions. And the second problem that comes with this is um, the 50% uh, ownership rule, uh, which requires a much more enhanced due diligence. Um, so which means that um, business cannot have deals with uh, companies that have 50% uh, that are owned or controlled um, by sanctions companies and that's 50%. And the problem with that of course is to track the whole um, transaction and not just to know about the, your end users. So we are not talking about uh, KYC but we're talking about KYCC so know your customer's customer. And OFAC's regulations again advise to not just to know the end user, but also the whole sort of uh, um, transaction line, who is dealing, who is engaged with this. And um, the beneficial ownership doesn't help in this respect, uh, of course, because the, those structures are very dynamic, indirect, hidden in uh, 
offshore uh, havens. So it's, it requires a lot of due diligence on the uh, private sector side. And recently, OFAC advised that uh, caused warning that you should be cautious with dealing uh, with companies that have 20 25% of ownership, meaning that those companies might be sanctioned in the future. So, um, and the second part of uh, sort of my points is uh, how did private sector react? Uh, the immediate response was from the banking sector, but also from private companies, in particular energy companies. Um, is to introduce sanctions clauses, something that we can diminish this sort of uh, destructive impact of sanctions, but also to diminish this uncertainty, how to deal until you wait for this uh, clarification of regulations. But in the long term, we see a much stronger pushback from certain countries, uh, Russia and China are the ones who are pushing maybe the, the strongest against the US uh, dominated uh, financial system, and there are at least four trends that we can distinguish. First of all is the de-dollarization of assets, and it comes to uh, reducing the shale of dollar in the international reserves, um, but also uh, government debt, sovereign debt, and uh, the currency settlements. The second trend is trade workarounds with alternative currencies and swaps, currency swaps. So um, surprisingly, Euro became the main sort of winner of this um, Russia and China trying to push back against the dollar. And now the share of Euro increased from 7% to 22% in bilateral uh, signed Russian um, trade deals. Um, the third one uh, is sort of these countries try to introduce new bank-to-bank uh, -bank payment system and we see uh, that they uh, try to create alternatives to SWIFT as something to uh, bypass uh, the sort of US controlled um, uh, payment system and according to the Central Bank of Russia currently 80% of domestic transactions are run through this and we see that BRICS countries are expressed their desires to join uh, Russian or Chinese alternatives to SWIFT. So we see a lot of uh, development on this front. And the, the last uh, trend, although there are many more perhaps, but the digital currencies are gaining the attraction in a way to bypass sanctions and to use a non-central uh, system to do deals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm under the strict instructions from my organizers to keep the time. So keeping uh, in view of the time, I want to have a second round, uh, one minute each to each panelist. I'm sorry for that, but you have to observe that one minute. And in a one minute, I'm going to ask you that after listening to each other, and uh, you are all experts in your field, uh, I want to hear from you one challenge and one opportunity which arises, uh, which can be beneficial and go and impact the connectivity of the Caspian region. Uh, and uh, this time, I'm not going to go by thematic, but I'm going to from Ethera onwards, please. So challenge-wise, I think it's important for countries. As you know, landlockedness means you are depending on someone else. So it's important that this large area between China and Europe has strategies that coincide and harmonize. So the biggest challenge is to make sure that all the countries along this route, they kind of understand the win-win benefit of it. So it's going to take a while uh, before this is being realized. The opportunity is all these new technologies, including this 3D printing, for example, is going to offer a lot of new things for the region. For, for example, in the next 10 years, I don't exclude, for example, some a student in Iran or South Russia, for example, sitting, ordering their iPhone cover and we, in, in Baku, for example, 3D printing it and delivering to them in less than 24 hours. So you can't beat this. Even if you are in China, you can't beat that 24 hour because I'm closer to the customers. So this is the other opportunity, I think. Thank you. Maria? The challenge and opportunity depends on the actor, so it might be different from... <laughs> but I talk a lot about, I guess, challenges, and one of the challenges, let's say, for uh, the West and the West, uh, part of the world would be the sort of pushback, the weaponization of sanctions, they are overused or misused, depending on the case. So the more uh, this sort of 
arbitrary application of sanctions happens, the more we'll see push uh, from non-Western countries to create something else. And one of the opportunities that I didn't mention um, before is the EU-initiated uh, INSTEC, the special vehicle system that Although currently it's, it allows basically to uh, do humanitarian aid, which is not sanctioned, but the, the sheer idea of EU, uh, EU as a legitimate sort of actor of the West to push back against the US system is something that uh, is very important and can undermine the legitimacy. Thank you, Maria. Alex, please. I want to think more positive. I want to see um, um, opportunities more than challenges. So we. I think we you can, can say two opportunities, not any challenge. <laughs> okay. I think that um, we can use the technology we already have here in, in Europe. We can bring that to the Caspian region and bring them one step further. Then, so they don't have to follow Europe. They have to probably just jump ahead and all employ, uh, integrate all the technology we already are deploying here in the area and um, bring in all the, the, the new... Um, more advantages in smart cities in supervising pipelines and probably detect problems before they even occur in the field and create a great mess or environmental damages and uh, increase safety on all the on all the infrastructure we have over there. Thank you, Derek. Please. All right. So, <clears throat> challenge-wise, I think um, I would say collaboration. Right. So, collaborating between private companies, between stakeholders, between governments, um, construction companies, right? So, I mean, if you're, and obviously here in, in my case, I'm talking about a project like ours, um, but not only ours, because at the end, we need to work together with other companies in order to really have an impact. Because if you can just move from one place to another really fast, but then once you're at destination, it will still take you a while. To get home, you're not really solving anything. And um, the opportunity, I mean, it's leapfrogging, right? It's um, being able to uh, ideally build something that makes economical sense, that doesn't need uh, government subsidies, so it can privately uh, can be privately financed, privately operated. Um, you're, you know, you can use innovation to solve the issues that you're having today. You can. I mean, you can push it literally forward further. Um, you don't only have to think about a Hyperloop. A Hyperloop system can also be part of, um, you know, of a freeway system if you want so, right? So there's a lot of different design proposals. So it's, uh, it's not only about moving uh, a capsule at the speed of sound, but there's a lot of ways. But on that only works if everybody really works together. You're able to push the regulators, you, you know, the finance uh, people are there, the, the partners are there. And um, a lot of the times, especially when you work between different countries, there's a fear, right? And this fear of collaboration needs to go away. Thank you, Derek. Azar, please. Thank you. Before answering to your question, I would like to ask Eva whether it is possible to show the map on the screen. No, the, the, the next one. The next one, the, the last one actually, the last one. Yeah. So you see the uh, the right uh, the right uh, cable in the middle it's by passing Caspian Sea. So this is the shortest uh, data traffic, data transmission uh, possibility from Europe to China. So that means uh, the most uh, the biggest challenge uh, for many many businesses the speed of uh, connectivity. So by building this Transcaspian fiber optic, we will make a, a, a for businesses ultra speed connectivity available, and that means they will have more possibility to develop their businesses. For example, from Europe to China, latency at the moment is about 20, 250 milliseconds. But after uh, uh, connection, connect, uh, after having this installed the Transcaspian fiber optic. The, connect, uh, the latency will be about 150 millisecond, which is almost uh, cutting down the third uh, of uh, 250 milliseconds. So this is the challenge, and this is the opportunity, which is uh, our region will can benefit, uh, the special businesses and the small and medium businesses can benefit from this connectivity possibility. Thank you.
Thank you, Azhar. And Baba, you have the last word. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think the uh, couple of biggest challenges will be to maneuver and deal with the politicians and the politics of the region. We'll have to rise above that if things have to happen. That's number one. Number two is how fast we can embrace technology and adopt innovation. These are the two other main areas where we need to look at. Now, um, the, the, the opportunities are if we can get the public sector, which is the government, and the private sector to, to, to on the same table to look at a development agenda. And each sector, if each sector can connect, like in the logistics area, we created a common, uh, national, a, a common association called EcolPAF. And we were looking at things, how we can uh, synergize things. So in each sector, as you mentioned, construction or X, Y, Z, or other, if each sector can do it, and I'll speak for my sector now, if we can get logistics and transportation people on the same table, and there's commonality of thought, or even if we start looking in the same direction. And mind you, this has already started. So uh, it's not something that we need to innovate, it's already started. If we can do these things, um, there is a huge benefit we can get. Um, uh, the second thing is the third. Well, the third thing is that you need to get global money to come this way. Global money must come in this region if prosperity is to come. And if prosperity comes here, the global economy will will uh, will increase. This is what Thank you very much. We have brought to our uh, time limit. Uh, I would not even attempt to summarize what I have been said. I think it was absolutely very clear. Uh, at least I myself say that there are new things which I learned uh, while moderating you. It was absolutely a pleasure uh, to moderate you all. And let's give a big hand to all the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.